evening, everyone. How are we doing? Everybody all right? Thank you for coming out today. We'll get the uh, proceedings started. My name is Joe Driscoll, the district counselor for the city of Syracuse, representing the east side. Uh, this issue of lead is something that uh, really knocked me off my feet when I first started reading about it. And it's a lot of what inspired me to want to run for office and get involved in the fight to try to bring us to a, a lead-safe community here in Syracuse. And since taking office, I've gotten to know a lot of the people that you're going to hear from tonight who have really uh, dedicated their lives to making this community better. So I'm, I'm honored to be a part of this event. Um, in studying the issue of lead and other municipalities that have had success, we've heard from uh, people involved that breaking down the silos of communication is one of the key steps to having success around this issue and that us all coming together and learning from each other is uh, a really strong tool to, uh, to move, the, move the ball forward with, with getting to a lead safe community. So we've had a great, great team of people working together from the county, the city, um, the DA's office. A lot of people have been coming together to pull the rope in the same direction and uh, I'd like to send my thanks to all of them and, and first person I'd like to introduce uh, someone who's taken the lead with a, with a great executive order on this, County Executive Ryan McMahon. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Councilor Driscoll. Thank you all for being here. And uh, there's so many great partners here this, uh, this evening, and thank you for taking time out of your schedules to be here. Uh, and obviously, just want to acknowledge some of these great partners we have um, from my team in county government and the health department, our uh, Dr. Kupta, I see you over here. Uh, certainly what we do in community development to help administer the lead grants, our uh, Department of Children's Services, our Department of Social Services. There's so many different departments that uh, really deal with young people and deal with families. And we need to work in a coordinated effort to make sure that we service our constituents the way they need to be serviced. And we really work towards that less safe uh, outcome. And like any effort, when we have success in this community, is when we come together and when we realize that there's been shortcomings in the past but we're moving forward in the same direction now moving forward and I really want to highlight some of the partners we've built uh, certainly the city of Syracuse uh, with Mayor Walsh who's you'll hear from shortly Councilor Driscoll uh, certainly was a very strong advocate certainly there's been a, a lot of community outreach on this issue uh, and different task force that local uh, community groups really pushed which is really, really helpful uh, in pushing that dialogue and getting the message out to neighborhoods. In addition to that, certainly Home Headquarters, Community Foundation, 211, CNY Fair Housing are other great partners that we've had throughout this process. And I think it's important to note that uh, we didn't start here at the local level. We actually went to the federal level, uh, worked with Congressman Katko, and the mayor and I, uh, and with the congressman's help, uh, brought Ben Carson, the HUD Secretary here in Central New York, for a very good roundtable discussion on this issue, highlighting the success we've had and the work that we still have to do and how the HUD program could be better tailored to help us be more successful moving forward. And certainly, if you look at uh, the successes we've had, it's been about funding. And in 2018, uh, certainly, we, uh, with the City of Syracuse and the county teaming up, uh, we got that $4.1 million grant from HUD. And then later, uh, or a couple weeks ago, uh, the county put in our application and we received a $5.6 million application uh, to further our, our lead grant program. And when you add the $2 million that the community foundation put in, that's the most lead money we've had to help address this issue. <laughs> and because of that, we've taken a new approach, uh, a carrot and a stick approach it because there's money here to help you with your issues. We have an old housing stock in Onondaga County, uh, specifically in the city of Syracuse. That's where the core of our community uh, was. It's where the houses were originally built. And if they were built before 1978, they probably have lead in it. And it, it, that's not a, a crime to have lead in your house. Where it is a problem is when there is lead exposed to human health and that becomes a risk. It is the responsibility of the homeowner to make sure that that issue gets addressed. Uh, so, uh, looking at that, we have help, and there's a lot of resources you'll hear about tonight to help that. But on the other side, Joe talked about it. Uh, we signed an executive order earlier this year that said, if you know that you have a violation where there's light in your property, and you do nothing about that, once we hear about that violation, we're going to freeze any assistance payments that you receive. And we won't just freeze those payments for that one unit, 
will freeze them for the entire property. So if you own a four unit property and you receive assistance payments for four units, we're going to freeze all those payments. Uh, and I wish we could go further with that executive order, but we can't. That's what the law will allow us to do. So in addition to that, our district attorney has made it very clear that for the bad actors, if you refuse to ignore your responsibility to your tenants and your community, that he will prosecute. And I, so we don't want to get there. That's not what this is about. But the, those are the consequences that you face, potentially, because the consequences for our young people are even worse. There's no cure for this. So I want to thank you all for your partnership and thank so many of you in this room for your leadership, whether it's civically, whether it's through your own departments, through your own organizations. Uh, I believe we will make more progress on this issue. We have to. Uh, and again, without partners, you can make this happen. And when we all swim in the same direction, we accomplish great things in this community. So thank you again for being here. Hopefully you'll get something from this. I know that we all have throughout this process. Thank you. Thank you very much, County Executive. Um, another great partner who's shown uh, tremendous leadership on this uh, throughout his campaign. He made this a priority for his administration. And since taking office, he has uh, held the course. And with MBD and other partners, uh, he's made this a priority for his administration. Please. Uh, welcome, Mayor Walsh. Good evening, everyone. Uh, really, all I have to say about the <laughs> executive is ditto. Uh, he, he pretty much covered it all. Uh, the reason we're all here is because, uh, as, as it says in that slide, we're all in this together. And while I think we, we've we always known that, uh, we haven't always acted like that. Mm -hmm. and, and we, it really, we really do have an unprecedented level of collaboration uh, that not only cuts across uh, governments, different levels of government, uh, but cuts across sectors as well. I see Peter Dunn out here, and the investment that the Community Foundation has made is significant. And as the county executive said, we do have uh, a level of funding and resources to tackle this problem um, more than we've ever had before. Uh, it's not enough. We need to do more, and, and we're committed to doing more. Um, we know that this issue disproportionately impacts uh, people in the city of Syracuse in specific neighborhoods, uh, and, and particularly our young people. And so we're focused on uh, building off of the momentum that we have uh, that we have right now. Uh, the county executive mentioned a $4.1 million grant. Uh, through that, uh, that process, which is underway, we hope to remediate up to 250 rental units. A lot more work to do, but but a significant step forward. And with the funding that the county has uh, most recently secured, uh, we're excited to do a lot more again in, in partnership uh, at every level. The state has been a, a great partner for us. Uh, the federal government, uh, we really are working together. Specific to the city of Syracuse, and, and you'll hear from our subject matter expert, Commissioner Stephanie Pasquale. Uh, we are looking at a number of things now. I acknowledge the role that uh, Councilor Driscoll has played in in, uh, in taking a, a, a leadership role um, on this issue uh, we do hope to advance uh, we do intend to advance a, a lead ordinance um, in the coming months on top of that we're looking at our, our permitting process to make sure we're streamlining the process by which tenants and developers and homeowners uh, can actually go about remediating their home and we're also using uh, intend to use our new tool our bureau bureau of administrative adjudication uh, which is now officially underway to help us tackle this issue as well so Lots to be excited about, lots more to do, and I look forward to continuing the work with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Walsh. So uh, up next, we have, uh, I like to call them the three musketeers of housing, <laughs> housing problems here in Syracuse and in Onondaga County. They do great work. Uh, we have Stephanie Pasquale with Neighborhood and Business Development. Uh, Deb Lewis with Onondaga County Health Department, and Katie Bronson with GHHI, uh, Green Healthy Homes Initiative with Home Headquarters. So Katie, uh, perhaps you should go, go into a little detail telling us um, about why lead is so hazardous and, and how to deal with it. So um, a number of years ago, uh, the Central New York Community Foundation brought a number of uh, healthcare and housing partners together to start talking about how we can really 
um, braid the resources and services we have available in regards to healthy housing, um, especially our indoor environmental quality and um, the lead and asbestos that are in our homes. From that, it um, speared our Green and Healthy Homes initiative that Home Headquarters has been administering for the past four years. And from that, we've really created a great partnership with healthcare partners, community partners, housing partners, municipalities, and local foundations in order to improve the health, safety, and energy efficiency for properties in the city of Syracuse and the greater Syracuse region. Uh, but that wasn't enough. We knew that there was more that we needed to do. And whenever we would have discussions about, um, you know, the bigger picture of healthy housing, the main topic that always came up was lead hazards in our home and how we can address them and how we can work together to improve them. Um, from that, we, had, we created our lead poisoning prevention plan called Get the Lead Out. And that plan is a guiding document. Um, and it's really a document that is not just about, you know, who can do what, but really for people to identify the roles that they can play in regards to lead poisoning prevention and addressing those lead hazards. And that's something I want to ask you here today, participants, um, whether you're homeowners, landlords, renters, um, an interested citizen, um, what role you can play with lead poisoning prevention. Um, because we all play different roles and we all have different specialties. And as you can see, we have four main focus groups that we sort of focused a lot of our um, strategies and action items. But that's just the first step. Because what we want to do is not only do we want to uh, provide you know, better information about the laws that are out there, but then we also want to provide better resources and education and workforce development so then people can get the right resources that they need in order to decrease the lead hazards in our housing and in our built, about, um, built environment, as well as decrease the elevated blood lead levels in our children. Um, so that being said, today we are going to be speaking about a number of different um, laws that are both federal, state, and local. Um, at the federal level, one of the things we will be talking about is the Renovate, Write, and Repair program. That is a requirement for contractors as well as landlords, and we'll be having people speak about that today. Um, we'll also be talking about the New York State Public Health Law that deals with lead poisoning prevention and lead hazards. And that's where the Onondaga County Health Department will provide some information on what their um, regulations are and how they work on that. And then we'll also talk about some of our local regulations <coughs> as well as, um, you know, uh, Mayor Walsh expressing that we are, they're also looking at the lead ordinance. So we're going to be talking about all different aspects of those resources. But again, you know, I think it's really important that we also take a look at the community. I mean, that is why we are here today, you know, and we have that as one of our main focus groups with the lead poisoning prevention action plan is that education and outreach um, you know some things that we all know is that we continue to have children and so we continue to have new parents so there's always an education process and an outreach that we will always have to have especially if we still have houses that were built before 1978 in addition to that, we have a lot of new Americans. So teaching them how to live in the homes that are built here in Syracuse is also very critical. Um, and one way that we have actually been doing that is through a video. Um, myself, as well as some partners, um, uh, we, I, I was part of a, the Health Foundation for Western and Central New York Fellowship Program. And uh, we came up with this uh, video. Um, it's a lead safe video and the 
target audience for that are residents, our tenants and homeowners of how to keep a lead safe environment. We might not be able to get rid of all the lead in a home, but what we also want to make sure is that people know how to keep a lead safe home. And what this video really shows is it's, it creates a way for people to understand what they can do to empower them. So this is actually a draft video. Um, we are going to be improving it. The Health Foundation did provide us some more additional funding. We couldn't do outdoor shots when we did our, our draft video because it was the winter. So we want to do some outdoor shots. But in addition to that, we want to get your feedback. Um, and we have a quick um, little survey up at the home headquarters table. So after you see the video and after our presentation today, please come up there, take a few minutes to fill out that um, that questionnaire because we do want to get your feedback for the improvements we're going to make um, as well as um, we are going to be providing incentives as well we're going to have a gift card we're going to do a raffle and then we're also going to do some potential gift cards for follow-up phone calls um, so we would really appreciate your help because again this is one role where you guys can play and give us feedback of how to improve it so i'm going to play the video um, you can start that. thank you Hello and welcome. Today, we will be talking about how to stay safe from lead hazards in and around your home. Lead can be found in many places around your house, including paint, pipes, air, dirt, dust, food, dishes, and water. Lead can be harmful for all people, but is especially dangerous for children under the age of six and for pregnant women. Most homes built before 1978 have lead paint in them. When the paint peels, cracks, or is worn down, the chips and dust from the old lead paint can spread around your home. When you and your children walk into the house, it's a good idea to take off your shoes at the door. If you have pets, be sure to clean their paws when they come in from outside. This may stop dirt, lead paint, dust, and other hazards from getting into your house. It also helps to use a doormat at every entrance to trap dirt and dust. Look at the inside and outside doors of your home. If you see any paint chips or dust, clean it with a wet wipe or a wet mop. Do not use a broom because that could cause the chips or dust to spray. Check the side, porch, garage, trim, windows, and doors outside your home for peeling paint. Dirt can have lead in it, so make sure children play on the grass instead of in the dirt. If you have a vegetable garden, Keep it away from the house, driveway, and drip line. Dirt could have old lead paint chips or dust, so it's best to create a raised bed garden using dirt bought from the store. Eating healthy foods helps to protect against lead poisoning. Foods with iron, vitamin C, and calcium can help prevent lead poisoning and should be included with every meal. Eat in clean places that have a lower risk for lead exposure. For example, at a table instead of on the floor. Always wash your hands with soap and water before eating a meal or snacks. It's important to check your dishes too. Traditional pottery, fiesta ware, and ceramic ware may contain lead. Look for a label that says lead free. Don't eat from dishes that are for decoration only. If you're not sure if a dish contains lead, don't use it. Lead can also be found in plumbing. Make a habit of letting the water run until it's very cold before using it. Only use cold water for cooking, drinking, and making baby formula. Boiling water will not remove the lead. Faucet or water pitcher filters can help, but make sure it is certified by NSF International by visiting nsf.org. You can test your water for lead. For more information, call EPA's Safe Drinking Water Hotline at 1-800-426-4791. Make sure the rooms where children play and sleep don't have lead in them. Keep the crib and play areas away from walls, windows, and doors with chipping or peeling paint. Clean your windows every month. Use a wet wipe or cloth for cleaning dust or chipped paint. Do not use a broom because that could cause the chips or dust to spray. Paint chips may taste sweet and appeal to young children. Keep your children away from windowsills, especially if they are teething. Be sure children do not put their mouths on the windowsill. Some vinyl blinds may have lead in them, 
so keep children and their bed or crib away from the blinds. Lead is sometimes found in children's toys and old furniture. If a toy is damaged, throw it away. If a toy has dust on it, clean it with a wet cloth. To find out if there are any lead recalls, sign up for the recall list at www.saferproducts.gov or call 1-800-638-2772. Clean your home every week. Vacuum with a high-efficiency particulate air vacuum or ATPA vacuum. Use a wet mop to clean floors. Wet wipes work well to clean dust, and you can throw them away when you are done. Do not use a broom because it can cause paint chips or dust to spread. If you're planning any home improvement projects, ask your contractor for their lead safety for renovation, repair, and painting, or RRP certificate. If you are doing the work yourself, take the RRP training to help you understand how to keep your workspace safe during renovations and cleanup. During your home improvement project, be sure children and pregnant women stay away from the work area. Wash your hands and your child's hands before and after eating, after playing, and after changing a diaper. Children under the age of six years old are at the highest risk for lead poisoning because they tend to put their hands and other items in their mouths. Lead can affect the child's growth, their behavior, and their ability to learn. At the age of one and two, have your child's blood tested for lead by their health care provider. It is a law in New York State and is important because young children are at a greater risk for becoming lead poisoned. Some jobs and hobbies may involve coming in contact with lead. This may include painters, artists, construction workers, and people who fish. Take off your work shoes before entering your home. Change any clothing that you think may have come in contact with lead. Be sure to wash your hands with soap and water before having contact with young children. Wash your work clothes separately from other clothes. Exposure to lead can create many health problems that can last a long time. Be sure to test your children for lead at one and two years old. Use the wet cleaning method whenever you're cleaning your home. Keep your home safe from lead by following the tips shared in this video. If you have any questions, contact the Lead Poisoning Control Program at the Onondaga County Health Department at 315-435-3271 or visit www.ongov.net forward slash health forward slash lead. Next, we have Deb Lewis. Deb, if you'd like to say a few words for us. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. So the, the timing of the town hall couldn't be better. Um, October is the month when National Lead Poisoning Prevention Awareness Week um, occurs. And the three most important messages that come out of this awareness campaign are to get the facts, which is what we're here to do today. Um, get your home tested and get your child tested. Um, you know, we understand very well that childhood lead poisoning has an impact on our community, um, both on the homes and the housing that we live in, as well as the future health of the individuals who are living within those homes. Um, there's also an economic impact to um, childhood lead exposure, and for every dollar that's invested, there's a great return on investment. So the grants that we have in this community are critically important um, and helping to improve our overall economy, the housing stock, the condition of housing, and eliminate risks for children living in them. Um, I can't stress enough the importance of preventive investment in rental properties. If you know rental property owners um, that don't really have a good plan for managing their properties in terms of looking at the paint regularly um, and evaluating that at uh, turnover for their units and at least periodically during a longer tenancy, encourage them to do that. Preventive investment in properties is protective for children's health. Um, and children is what this is really all about. Um, the impact of lead uh, is significant on children and could have lasting health and developmental impact. 
it's incredibly important to make sure that children are tested by their health care provider at age one and age two and followed up with any additional testing needed based on their test result. The importance of well child visits and primary care services can't be stressed enough. Um, your, doctors, your child's doctor is responsible for developmental evaluation and periodic monitoring of child's growth and development and can quickly identify anything that is impacting their health negatively, including the exposure to lead at an early age. So the role of the health department um, is a pretty specific one and is guided by um, New York State Department of Health Regulation Public Health Law. Um, we are required to test, uh, to, to review the testing results of every child in Monadoga County. And based on what that test result says, then we provide services um, that will address the child's needs. Um, we will do environmental risk exposure assessment for children who have an identified elevated blood lead test result, as well as um, work with our local health care providers to ensure that follow-up care and services are provided based on the New York State Department of Health Regulation and Public Health Law. Today um, is October 1st, and it's the very first day of a set of new regulations that went into effect in New York State. Um, and what this highlights is the importance of the provider's responsibility for follow-up um, services to children with a lead level over five, which is a dramatic change in New York State uh, and holds providers accountable for a greater number of children who require uh, more comprehensive services than ever before. Um, we are very much in support of providing this comprehensive list of services to children with elevated blood lead test results, um, and we'll work very closely with providers in our community to coordinate the care of each child with an elevated test result. The health department's role and responsibility is that environmental risk assessment and in-home lead inspection. Uh, we will work closely with providers to make sure that children are receiving the developmental evaluation and screening that they may need, um, and link families to resources in the community based on the provider's evaluation of that child's needs. When one of our inspectors um, gets a referral for an inspection, every inspection is handled exactly the same. Um, if, a, if a lead paint inspection finds hazards in a home, uh, the inspector will generate a letter to both the tenant and to the owner that lists all of the hazards that were identified during the inspection. The owner is given a specific time frame to make the necessary repairs and given specific information and instructions on what to do next, who to contact, how to contact them, what would be the penalty for not fixing and repairing the hazards that were identified during the inspection, um, and the contact information for the inspector that they should reach out to should they have questions. The best advice that we can give anyone that receives a letter from the health department that indicates their property has lead paint hazards within it is to call us, get in touch with the inspector, ask questions, schedule an appointment to walk through the property to learn what exactly has to be done to make the needed repairs, and stay in touch as you're working on the property to keep us up to date on the progress. So in our area, what we have seen over time is that children's test results are pretty consistent with what we see at the state and national level. Um, overall, the number of children tested that have an elevated test result has fallen and continues to decline. Um, there are still more children in our community that are identified with elevated test results than we're happy about, and we're continuing to work with our community partners and with our provider community to make sure um, that we are addressing this through testing, education, outreach, um, and environmental management. So what's changed? You know, I said that we've had some changes over time, but when we look at the properties in our community that have been associated with children with elevated test results, um, you still see the same areas are highlighted in both maps. The map on the left shows darker coloring, which means that there are more children in those areas that have higher test results. On the right, the coloring is a little bit lighter, which means that we're seeing some improvement in that the number of children overall that have test results at the highest levels is lower than it was five years ago. So what are we doing? What are we doing about lead? Um, one of the most important things that we can do, as you heard a few minutes ago, is to break down silos and improve communication between all of the people who touch the lives of families in our communities. 
We have um, a relationship with the city of Syracuse that is unprecedented in our area. We are the only um, county health department that actively shares information on lead inspections with their city counterpart um, and provides that information so that the code inspectors of the city know what that information is when they're touching the same property. Um, we are we working share information with you too, Deb. Yes, you do. <laughs> Our inspectors work pretty closely together. They're like dialing each other up all the time to see what's going on in a property before they go out. Um, the information is available on the city's website, and Stephanie can tell you how that works. Um, but you know, the, the point about housing information being accessible to the public is something that we have worked really hard to improve over the past couple of years. Uh, one of the other great partnerships that we have formed is with the Department of Social Services Economic Security, and there's a link between the city, the county health department, and the Department of Social Services, in that the city had an existing way to stop rent in a property that had um, health and safety violations or was considered to be unfit. And we were able to utilize the same process that was already being used by the Department of Social Services with the city, and they developed a kind of a button for us to push and when we get to push the button because the owners fail to comply with correcting identified hazards, the rent is stopped through Department of Social Services. And as you heard earlier, it's not just in the inspected unit, it's in any other funded unit in the property uh, owned by that owner. Um, raising awareness through these town halls is very important to make sure that you know, people see what's happening behind the scenes. One of the frustrations that we hear a lot, and you know, before and after each town hall, we've had different conversations with people um, that have shared their thoughts, their concerns, and their frustrations with us. And you know, what you see on the surface is calm ducks floating on top of a calm pond, and but you don't see all of these little feet under the water that are furiously paddling to get us moving ahead in the same direction. Um, that happens behind the scenes every day. The group of people in this room who are committed to addressing childhood lead poisoning are committed and dedicated and are constantly talking to each other to find new ways to collaborate and figure out how our individual silos overlap and connect so that we can find new strategies for addressing this problem. And with that, I'd like to introduce my friend and colleague, Stephanie Pasquale. Commissioner, Department of Neighborhood and Business Development, City of Syracuse. That's a mouthful. Thanks, Dad. That's a mouthful. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for being out here um, tonight on this warm evening, but, but also for, um, there's so many um, recognizable faces in the room that have been working on and helping with this issue. Um, as Deb and others have talked about, and many service providers work hard on helping humans and, and, and finding um, different new ways to find, to identify areas where um, elevated blood levels can be addressed as quickly as possible. But I think in the par in partnership with the city of Syracuse, we try to follow the space, the house. How can we help in this effort to make sure that those units aren't rented again and again, um, that we know have, um, have health hazards? So what do we know about, about, about the city of Syracuse and our and rental units? We have about 69,000 housing units in the city. Um, of which about 96% of those are one, two, and three family buildings. Now our one, two, and three family buildings are typically um, in our high risk areas, our rental properties, and the vast majority were built before 1980. Um, so we have an aging and older housing stock. It's beautiful, the architecture is wonderful, but the um, energy efficiency and some of the um, health, health hazards that result um, can be um, difficult difficult challenges to overcome. So we do do a lot of interior inspections, but what we find of late is, is roughly only 40% of these units pass that first interior inspection. So it's critical for us to make sure that we catch these as quickly as possible and have those violations addressed. Um, I think this is a pretty salient point that only 20% of the county's children um, live in the city of Syracuse, yet 87% of the children under six with elevated blood lead levels um, live in the city. So we know that while this is a definitely a countywide problem, the vast majority of children facing this um, live in the city of Syracuse. So we've worked really hard to figure out how to address a lot of these rental properties. So we do do a lot of data sharing, and we know we can't be everywhere at once. So how do we target the resources and staffing that we do have? So we look at data over time to see which census tracts in particular um, seem to be housing um, the most egregious properties or the most high-risk properties. 
So you wouldn't be surprised to see that the, those, those census tracts that have the higher rates of lead poisoning are also those that are um, high poverty and have um, a lot of housing instability and mobility. So we've been working really hard with all these partners um, that are mentioned here today and many others to develop a comprehensive approach to, to healthy housing um, that emphasizes compliance, proactive enforcement, not reactive, uh, communication between tenants and landlords, improving those communications and um, having these strong community partnerships um, right from the get-go around, around inspections. So I won't, I won't list all of the things, um, but a lot of outreach is happening um, proactively with our inspectors holding meetings at, um, in, right in the neighborhoods, talking to people just about how do you, how do you contact code enforcement, um, what, what, um, what do we look for when we come into the property, just really trying to break down that sort of on the get-go adversarial or, or fear <coughs> approach um, to contacting code enforcement. Um, as Deb mentioned, we've been using software can be a blessing and um, in many ways the software that we, that we have, we are able to share data in real time um, with our partners at the health department and others and that is available on the city's portal. Um, so we hope that housing locators and housing um, uh, placement providers are always looking there, that anyone looking to rent a new property goes and looks up the address and make sure there's no open violations or that there, there is not a history of uh, successive violations there. Um, we've been working a lot in the community around kitchen table talks and getting you know, real information from people who are facing these issues every day um, and what their barriers to, um, to housing, to quality housing are and how we can address that. Um, we've held a couple of healthy homes tours to show inspectors and other service providers what an unhealthy home looks like and what to look for when you're, when you're in a home setting. Um, we have been sharing a ton of data amongst and between ourselves, um, again, to identify those parcels or properties that have um, come up on lists more than once. <coughs> and I think you're gonna hear a little more about some of the legal um, remedies that we have, in addition to what the, what the mayor mentioned earlier, um, around finally having the ability to enforce your ticketing. And that is hopefully gonna be a game changer for us and as we're unrolling that process, and we've, had, we've issued a couple hundred tickets, and um, it is getting people's attention. Um, we do work on certain cases um, together to make sure our property doesn't get forgotten and that we can bring every tool at our disposal to remedy that. Um, we're really grateful for creative approaches that the Central New York Community Foundation and GHHI have brought um, to this, this sort of fight. Um, some of the things, um, you know, the county executive mentioned how some of these programs are wonderful and we're so glad to have these resources here, but they can be very difficult to administer. So how do we try some new things? Well, we're working on a pilot with the Land Bank and the Community Foundation to address some rental property and to really just get in there, sort of surgically get the job done and lease up those, those properties and, and so that we know we brought online some healthy and safe housing. We've really reorganized codes and have inspectors instead of, I'm in the southwest quadrant, which is enormous, to have a real piece of the earth that's small. It gets to really know property owners, um, neighborhood asset and advocates, um, so that people will get to know that Deb's your inspector. Inspector, yeah, Deb. Um, but that you would really get to know who that person is and that landlords would feel, um, just develop those relationships, and I think that's critically important. Um, our inspections, and there's some brochures out on the table, I hope I encourage anybody to grab, have a health and safety focus. When we're, when we're going through a unit and we're trying to you know, explain, we had the landlord <coughs> panel last week to talk about how we are looking for health and safety items. We're not looking for every little tiny thing that's wrong with the apartment. Um, and we hope that, that that trusted message and that that is received and that we're consistent with the delivery of that. Um, we're offering financial assistance as an incentive. You, you heard today about increased funding. Um, if we do find violations, we are when we send out violations, we're putting cards right in the violation notice. We're constantly telling people about what programs are available, um, and that that we know that this is a partnership, and we know that together um, we need to work with our area landlords to get this done. We do have rental licensing or rental registries, and just a year, a year ago in July, we're able to now um, mandate interior inspections, and I think that's been helpful in identifying those health and safety violations on the interior properties. Um, there are about 6,000 properties that are um, eligible for rental registries, um, and that we're slowly, I think we've got through about 2,000 of those, so we still have a ways to go. Um, we talked a little bit about the ticketing and the Bureau of Administrative Adjudication, and identifying these priority properties to either remediate them or get them off 
the planet. So that those are the kind of conversations we have with the degree to which a property um, is, is able to be fixed up or whether it's just um, not a candidate for going forward. Um, I think a couple people mentioned tonight our lead ordinance. It's been, we're going through an environmental impact statement process right now. We're super close to releasing that and having public meetings. We love the support of anyone and everyone in this room to come out for that and make sure that voices are heard around how important it is um, for our inspectors to be able to cite for lead paint hazards. Right now under New York State Building Code, our City of Syracuse inspectors can, if they see chipping and peeling paint, they can cite for chipping and peeling paint, but whether or not it has, it's a lead hazard um, is not right now an existing violation. We have to set that locally ourselves. And that's all, we'll have some questions later, I think, right? Thanks so much. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, great. So, uh, our next speaker will be Saisha Bird. Um, Saisha is a City of Syracuse homeowner who will share a story about lead issues that she experienced after she purchased her home in 2010. She is a native of Syracuse, uh, has a BS from Cuca College, and a master's in social work from Syracuse University. Saisha spends 16 years working with youth through the Boys and Girls Club of Syracuse. She now works for Syracuse University, building relationships and engaging students from all over the campus and encouraging them to get involved. Her goal is to bridge the gap between the Syracuse University community and the communities in the city of Syracuse, which is a great goal that I share. Uh, she's been a passionate advocate for her neighborhood and, and the city in general, and I will start off by showing uh, a video that was done by TNT. For those of you unfamiliar, tomorrow's neighborhoods today, they've done a lot of great work raising awareness and reaching out to people this past year. So here's a video they did featuring Saisha. After a routine health checkup for my children, we found out that the boys had lead in their blood. As a parent, I was afraid, I was scared, I was worried that I had done something wrong. Hi, my name is Saeed Shabird, and I'm a TNT volunteer. My name is Takara Smith, and I am the board delegate for Southside's TNT. TNT raises awareness about the dangers of lead paint. It's important to inform all parents of the dangers because it could really affect a young child. It could mess with their motor skills and their learning development. Children who are exposed to lead um, as a toddler can experience lifelong health problems ranging from behavioral concerns to difficulty with learning. Children with lead poisoning have a tendency to act out in school. They have a harder time concentrating and learning, and they don't know why. That might not be identified as a toddler, because you may not see those difficulties until the child is well into their school-aged years. This is a big part of my work at TNT, just taking the time out to educate my community and those around me that how dangerous lead paint could be for our children, because the majority of the homes that were built on the north side are really older houses. The south side of Syracuse is known for having historic homes, but unfortunately they're plagued with lead paint. So it's important that we encourage the community to be aware and lead safe so that they can identify these issues so they can be rectified. And we're really thrilled that CNT is in the forefront of educating their neighbors and bringing people into the conversation. TNT is here to help you make your community a better place. Good evening. In 2010, I was frustrated with renting from landlords that struggled to keep their properties up. I was ready to live the American dream and wanted to purchase my own home. I fell in love with a beautiful house on the north side of Syracuse built in 1850. The house had original oak wood floors, um, windows with trim, bevel, like the bevel decorated windows, which I still have, um, and huge rooms. What was most impressive was, was the huge backyard that was perfect for my son to play in. I knew the home needed work, but I was willing to do what it took to make it my own. After closing on the house, I remember receiving a pamphlet about lead from home headquarters. I sat down and read it from front to back. I was sure this house, as old as it was, never had any major updates and most likely contained lead paint. I had already taken the first time homeowners course at home headquarters, so I knew there was tons of grants out there that I could apply for, 
to make my home safe for my child. I filled out an application for Peace Inc.'s Weatherization Assistance Program, applied for funding from Empire Housing, and called the Syracuse Lead Program to have the house tested for lead paint. A few weeks later, an inspector tested the house and indeed it tested positive for lead. The inspector found lead paint in the bathroom, the back hallway, around the windows, and on the front porch. Because I was eligible for a grant from the city, um, from Syracuse Lead Program, all of the windows were replaced and all the other areas were painted with three coats of new paint. The painted porch floor was covered with indoor outdoor carpet. The contractors used a hemp vac, excuse me, vacuum to make sure any dust or paint was cleaned up. When the windows tested positive again, the construction crew came back and did one last cleanup and the lead I thought was gone. In 2013, I had my second son and 18 months later, my third. As many moms can attest, it is tough having two babies in diapers. Over the summer, we spent a lot of time on the enclosed porch playing with their toys. It was a safe place for my boys to play, stay cool, and enjoy themselves. <coughs> Again, so I thought. At the end of the summer, I took the boys in for their scheduled wellness appointment. Their doctor was happy with their growth and cognitive development. He told me whatever I was doing, I was doing great as a mom. About a week later, I received a phone call that shook my world. The nurse on the other end told me that my boys tested positive, um, their test came back higher than they would like to see for lead and asked me to bring the boys back in for another round of testing. After their second test, one of the boys still had a, a test result high enough to require additional testing. That afternoon, I sat and racked my brain thinking, how could they have been exposed to lead when I did everything I could to protect my boys? After a while, I remembered how much we had spent, um, how much time we had spent on the porch over the summer playing. I started looking up lead in floors, lead in carpet, and fell upon an answer. The carpet that the contractors installed on the porch was indoor-outdoor carpet with breathable fibers. During my research, I discovered the carpet had, um, had to be backed with rubber to contain the paint particles and dust underneath so that they wouldn't find their way back up to the surface. I immediately started calling around to ask for help with replacing the carpet. I called all the agencies I had worked with before to figure out who could help. When I finally reached home headquarters, I learned they had a program called SHARP, and I could apply for funding to replace the carpet. As an extra step, I also got rid of all the boys' toys that they had played with on the porch. I continued to follow up with their doctors to keep an eye on their test results. After a few months, the boys' levels were no longer high. I'm glad I kept the routine doctor's appointments and that they were tested because I wouldn't have found out. Having their test done at the right time helped my boys immediately get the necessary care that they needed and helped me find out where the lead was hiding. For months while my boys and I were going through this, I was angry, sad, and scared. I already knew the effects lead poisoning could have on children. I saw the effects firsthand when I was supervising a young lady that worked um, during, through the CMY Work Summer Program at the Boys and Girls Club with me. She never sat still. She was always moving and talking. She had a big personality and was great at making people laugh. I always had to give her tasks that required her to move all the time. One day while I was talking with her, I said, girl, do you have ants in your pants or something? <laughs> she looked at me and kind of cracked up laughing and then asked, could we go into a private office to talk? She explained to me, um, that she had been exposed to lead paint at a very young age, that it was very high and it had affected her everything, her world. Um, her exposure to lead affected her in so many ways. Um, it was hard for her to concentrate on one thing at a time and she had a lot of energy. She had trouble controlling her energy and it kept her moving all the time and sometimes got her in trouble. From that day forward, I promised myself that I would do whatever it took to educate others about the long-lasting effects of lead exposure and lead poisoning. I then started to educate parents at the Boys and Girls Club and at Central Village, the Boys and Girls Club I worked in, in that neighborhood. I helped coordinate the Syracuse Housing Authorities and Boys and Girls Club Health and Wellness Fair and invited programs from the city, the county, and asked our local agencies to set up tables to talk to parents and share information. 
Right after I brought my home, I started going to my neighborhood TNT meetings. Later on, I started working more closely with TNT around neighborhood development issues, neighborhood safety, and how to deal with deteriorating homes. I continue to talk to my neighbors, to my TNT group, and to my friends and family about getting their children tested and how to protect their children from lead in their home. There's so many things that we all could do to protect our children. Check your children's toys. Make sure they don't, you don't let them put toys and non-food items in their mouth. Pay attention to recalls um, because <laughs> my kids love to shop at the Dollar Tree and many of those toys get recalled for lead. Um, cover your outdoor painted floors with rubber back carpet and pay attention to the paint. If it's chipping, paint it. Call your landlord, call the county, call the city. Um, get your children tested. And I was just explaining to someone up in the audience that I keep, literally keep gallons of paint around my house because as soon as something chips, I want to paint it because I want to make sure that they're protected. <laughs> but thank you all. Thank you so much, Sasha, for all the work you've done throughout the years. Very appreciated. So to give you guys a full context, so now we're going to have a panel of uh, experts join us on stage, and after that we'll open it up to questions from the audience. But right now joining us, uh, in addition to Stephanie, Katie, and Debbie, we have uh, Marty Skain with uh, Onondaga County uh, Community Development, Melanie Cardin with uh, District Attorney's Office, and Katie White with 211. <coughs> That's everyone. Thank you all for joining us. So our first question, uh, I guess all of you can handle this, Stephanie, Marty, Katie. Uh, what, if, what does someone do if they need help making repairs? What are the resources that are available to people who are uh, in lead hazardous environments? And what resources can they reach out to? Um, so you've you, you heard a little bit today around the, the different lead hazard control programs that are available, um, and we are working at the city of Syracuse, um, was successful in obtaining an application uh, to, to address over 200 housing units in the city of Syracuse. Um, the phone number's right up there, 448-8710, uh, um, and also on our website. But we are, you know, we, we do work in partnership, we work together. Marty's going to talk about the details of how the lead program works. But what I want to communicate to you all is how how, how we work in partnership, how at the city in, in, in particular, where, where our program I think fits in, and I, and I know Marty would agree with, with the new dollars they've gotten, is to really target those census tracts that need it the most. And that's those are the hardest applications to get in. It's the hardest projects to do. Um, Patty Lynch on our staff is up there. Patty knows better than anyone. I know Mary Margaret O'Hara is here somewhere. She's our live program manager. But these, um, what, what we require for these programs is a lot of documentation and a lot of paperwork. It takes a lot of patience and a lot of, uh, I guess, tenacity, if I can use that word, um, to get the information in um, and to get these projects done. So we're incredibly grateful to work with our partners on the, the county on the construction side of things, but also to really target efforts that we get referrals from, uh, whether it's from our code inspectors or from the health department or other places to get that work done. Um, at Home Headquarters, we have a number of programs, both for homeowners and for landlords. Um, depending on whether you're a homeowner um, we, and you have children under the age of six, we always refer them to the City of Syracuse program. Um, if you are a landlord, um, we also have some programs that are available where you don't need to have a child under the age of six. It's funding through the City of Syracuse. It's the Syracuse Landlord Program, and that's a 50% loan and 50% deferred loan um, to address lead hazards as well as code violations. In addition to that, we have some funding from the Central New York Community Foundation for Windows and Doors, and that's specifically for Census Tract 23, 54, and 58, um, and that's to address, again, windows and exterior doors. 
Um, another funding source that we do have available um, is for RRP training, the Renovate, Write, and Repair training, and the firm certificate. Um, that is for landlords and contractors because we want to make sure that they are prepared and ready to do the work. Um, so those are just some highlights that we have that are specific to lead at home headquarters, but I always suggest people to come to our tables to give us a call to ask some specific questions about your home and what you're interested in doing and we can guide you in the right direction. I'm going to call her. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's great to be here and see everyone who came out tonight. Um, so as the county executive stated, we have an unprecedented amount of funding between the two grants the city and the county have from HUD for lead hazard reduction, along with the money from the community foundation. Um, it's an unprecedented amount of money and we have 42 months to spend it, so we're hoping everyone will help us achieve that goal so we can get our next round of funding and just keep going and going. Um, the applicants uh, for the program need to meet the following requirements. You have to live in the home with a lead paint hazard, have a child under six who lives in or spends the majority of time in the home. And that's important to point out. So the six-year-old doesn't have to reside at the home full time. If there's a place they spend the majority of their time as well, that place can be um, uh, qualified for the program. Um, you have to own or occupy a one to four family residential structure. Um, and the other important thing to understand is the qualification for the program is based on the um, tenant's income, not on the owner's income. So no matter what income level the owner's at, it's based on the person who's actually living in the unit with the child under six. Um, the household income is 80% of the median, which currently is around $63,000 for a family of four. And once you get qualified, our team does all the work. Um, we schedule a time to come and test the home for lead. We determine what work needs to be done to reduce the lead hazard. We bid out the work, we get a contractor, and then we oversee the work until completion. And it's also important to understand that if a child has an elevated blood level, once your application is complete, that application moves to the top of the pile to be addressed immediately. Um, so uh, that's pretty much how the program works. So if you have any questions or want more information, stop by our table in the lobby, or uh, you can call our office at 435-3558. And we'll be happy to uh, help you and see if you can qualify for some assistance. Thank you. Yeah, just to remind everyone, please uh, stick around, check out the tables afterwards. A lot of these people will be, uh, these organizations are up tabling up top. So if you have specific questions about a you know, specific situation, specific property, uh, they can help guide you to the right resources. <clears throat> uh, next question is, uh, obviously, we're hoping to rely more on carrots than sticks. Um, when it comes to improving this problem, but um, uh, Melanie from the district attorney's office, if you could tell us about potential charges, what happens when the landlord just continually ignores all the orders to remediate the lead hazard, and how do you move forward? Thanks, Joe. Um, it, the key point that I do want to start out by saying is that the charges that we're talking about really do depend on some continuous ignorance of the order. So the one that we most recently, we've um, charged seven landlords in the, the area with this was is willful violation of public health law, which is section 12B1 of the public health law. That is an A misdemeanor. Basically what that says is that you willfully ignore a, an order by the county health department. But on practical sense, what it means is that the, the county health department, and Deb can echo this, essentially they go out, they do testing in the, in the homes to identify lead hazards, they send out notification to the landlord, allowing them the opportunity to remediate and repair. If after that they have not done so, after that there's a hearing held by the county where they are then ordered and given a deadline to actually, again, repair the lead. So it requires really two chances for the landlord to completely say, we're not gonna do this, we're not going to do anything. And if they do that, then we can charge them with this willful violation of public health law, which is a misdemeanor. Um, in addition, there are potential charges for endangering the welfare of a child, which is essentially that when somebody, in this case the landlord, knowingly acts in a manner that is likely to be injurious to the physical, mental, or moral welfare of a child under the age of 17. So it's kind of a broad, all-encompassing charge, but in this case, we, we would argue that it does apply, that a landlord, in continuing to allow a child that they know lives there and they know they have lead in the home to continuously be exposed to that, knowing the dangers that the child faces under that exposure, they could be charged with that EWOC charge. 
And then last, if a child is seriously injured or, God forbid, passes away, then there are charges, uh, felony charges of reckless endangerment or possible homicide charges. So the question is, under these circumstances, what are the potential consequences? So that public health law violation, the 12B1 section, that's actually punishable by up to a $10,000 fine. And both the public health law and also endangering the welfare of a child are also punishable by up to a year in jail. Obviously, the reckless endangerment and the homicide charges would carry significant prison time with those uh, if we were to convict with those. So bringing that all around, so what do we do? Now we've got a landlord, we've got a tenant, we've got a child. What do we do with these charges? And this gets back to what Joe was talking about, that we really do try to take a holistic approach and, and hopefully still with the uh, kind of community prosecution model, we're trying to make the community a better place, right? We're trying to actually take these homes that we know are here, we know we're kind of stuck with, and how do we make these better for the people that live in them? So when we come to a disposition, we, we look at whether there's an injury to the child or the tenant, we look at how long it took the um, landlord to remediate and whether they actually did make any progress towards remediation or if they completely ignored it, how many properties the landlord owns, and then also the, the code violations. So most of these cases so far have been heard in Syracuse City Court in the housing court, and that's in front of Judge Ann Magnarelli. And what we've been trying to do is take a really um, a comprehensive approach towards the entire building and say, okay, in conjunction with the city, we know that you have these lead violations, but we also know that you have these open code violations. And if you want to do anything where we're going to consider less than a misdemeanor or less than a significant fine, you got to fix all of it, and you got to fix it in all of the homes that you own in the city. So we really do try to make it um, make it safer. We're not necessarily out to put people in jail or, or you know just rake money from people who are, are owning homes in the city, but really to make it a better and safer place for the kids to live. All right, our next question um, is to Deb Lewis. Um, so the question, um, why does WIC no longer do lead testing? And if you need the, uh, do you need the clicker, Deb? No, you can just pop right. my name on there so that I'm speaking, that'd be all right. Thank you. Um, so we talked before about the requirements for testing children. New York State Department of Health requires children are tested at age one and two. Um, and follow-up services are provided based on the child's test results. Now, over the past several years, um, clinic testing activity at the Onondaga County Health Department has steadily declined, and there's been a corresponding increase in the number of tests that have been provided to children by their primary care provider, which is great news. That's exactly what we want to see happening. Children should be receiving their medical care from their primary care provider, who is better equipped to explain the test results to them, provide diagnostic evaluation and assessment, monitor the child's growth and development, and make appropriate referrals for services based on the test results. Um, while WIC doesn't provide testing any longer, their regulations require that they do screen all children who are enrolled in WIC for whether or not they have a doctor and whether or not they are in need of a lead test. So if a child is enrolled at WIC, and they're identified as a child in need of a test, whether that's a one or two year old test or a follow up test because they've been identified with an elevated test before, WIC is now making a referral to the health department led program and we are going to be working directly with the families and the providers of those children to make sure that they have appropriate and timely testing provided. Now, um, every one of these town halls has been a little bit different and we've heard comments from each of you and we thank you for that that there are obstacles for some families in receiving care from their primary care doctors. One of the responsibilities of the local health department is to identify barriers to care and to address those barriers um, in the community. And we do that in collaboration with our medical provider partners and the community partners here in this room. Um, what we will do for families who are experiencing real and insurmountable obstacles to access to care is work directly with the family to address those obstacles, whether that be coordinating transportation, assisting with language accommodation, and in some cases, screening the family for need for testing in an alternate site. And in that case, that would be testing through our Bureau of Disease Control Clinic, which is able to do phlebotomy services on a limited basis. We would encourage anyone who is experiencing a delay or a difficulty in getting testing 
um, by their own doctor's office or having difficulty with laboratories to get in touch with us directly so that we can help troubleshoot and get the family connected to appropriate services. Great, thank you, Deb. Uh, so our next question is to Katie White. Where do families go to get information and how do they access the information that they're looking for around the issue of lead and, and uh, how, to, how best to approach it? Thanks. Um, so I'm here with 211CNY. Um, we're a program of contact community services. 211 um, is an information and referral resource. We house a database of over 5,000 resources in our five uh, county coverage area. So that includes Onondaga, Oswego, Jefferson, Lewis, and St. Lawrence counties. Um, so what people do is they dial 211 from their phone, and if they're anywhere in that five county region, they're gonna get connected with 211CNY. Um, and when we talk about information referral for health and human services, we really mean the whole thing. Um, the types of calls we get are people looking for help with housing, utilities, food, employment, education, healthcare, anything you can think of that falls under that large umbrella of health and human services, we probably have a term for that in our database and we can locate those resources. Um, so people can access us in a few different ways, which I'll get into. Um, but the types of resources vary from anything from shelter to, I saw a dead deer on the side of the road and I don't know what to do with it. Um, so it really ranges. Um, it doesn't have to be somebody in a crisis situation. It can be just somebody who has a situation and doesn't quite know what to do with it. Um, and we'll do our best to problem solve and determine the best resource to connect you to. Um, when it comes to things to lead, which is what brings us here today, we do have some specific categories for lead resources. Um, that includes lead information, lead abatement, lead poisoning screening, and lead testing. Um, so all these wonderful programs that you're hearing about today, um, that's a lot of information to take in. And we already have that information. So if you need um, to recall something, you, you know, you heard about a program, you can't remember exactly which one, you have a brief description of what they do, if you call 211, we can get you that information. Um, and we also work um, with the Early Childhood Alliance um, with Help Me Grow. So that's a fairly new initiative. Um, what they do at Help Me Grow is they provide support for parents um, and caregivers on healthy childhood development. Um, so that's assessments to see how your child is developing, advocacy in terms of getting you the support that you may need. Uh, that program is accessed through 211. So if you call 211 and you ask for Help Me Grow, we connect people directly with that service. Um, and we also try to connect anybody who's calling um, about a child. So they may be looking for children's clothing, children's school supplies, um, childcare, anything like that. We will recommend um, Help Me Grow as a resource and make that connection. So how do you access 211? So there's a bunch of different ways to access us. We try to be as accessible as possible. Um, we're available 24-7. So that includes holidays, weekends, middle of the night, we're always there. Um, by phone, you can call us just by dialing 211. So just like you would dial 911, you dial 211. And if you're in our five county coverage area, you're gonna get us. If you're outside of that area, 211 um, covers the entire state of New York and most of the country as well. So there are other call centers in, in the state and the country that um, take these kinds of calls so they can locate resources in those other counties um, if that's where you're located. Um, we also have a toll-free number that you can call from any location so it doesn't have to be in our coverage area and you'll get up to us directly. Um, we have an email that you can use um, that's accessed by all of our database um, staff that works to update the 211 database. Um, we have a website at 211cny.com um, which we're working on building actually a section for what we're calling healthy housing. Um, so information referrals on specific resources um, that comes to, when it comes to um, healthy homes. So things like lead, things like asbestos, things like mold. Um, we're gonna really work to build out our website so that all that information and those resources are available in one uh, succinct spot. And recently, as in last week, we actually opened up live texting. Um, so now 211 can be accessed by text. Uh, if you text your zip code to 898-211 and you're in one of those five counties that we cover, um, that text is gonna come to our center and we can respond to you in that uh, form. 
Um, right now, because it is brand new, we are only available for limited hours, but we're hoping to eventually come 24 seven. Um, and we're hoping that we're gonna you know, catch a whole new uh, generation of people who a lot of people don't like making phone calls anymore. So text is a little more anonymous, um, it's a little easier, and also it means the information is right there on your phone already. Um, so we're hoping to see that grow um, as we continue with it. Um, and then just a little bit about exploring our website. Um, this is our home page. Um, there are different search methods. I do like to share kind of how it works because it's not quite a Google search. Um, and if you, you want to make sure you're going to the right place. Um, so there is that text search box. But like I said, it's not a Google search, so you really want to just put in a keyword of the type of resource you're looking for. Um, you can choose by county, so all of those um, counties are clickable links. Um, Browse all topics will really take you to our full detailed categorization of resources. Um, so if you're really struggling to find what you're looking for, that's the best place to go. And then our popular topics are things that are commonly searched for or asked about. So all those things like food, housing, utility assistance, um, will take you right to those resources. And then there's also a link to our Help Me Grow website, um, which has a similar search function, um, but all the resources there are really related to childhood development. Um, they have a lot of information on their page as well as access to some assessment questionnaires um, and things like that. So. We really are a one-stop shop. We are a clearinghouse of information and referral. Um, and we really encourage people to reach out to us if they're not sure where they need to head next. Great. Thank you, Katie. So I appreciate Thank you all, our panel, for coming in today. Uh, thanks for all your presentations. Uh, at this point, we'd like to open it up to the group for questions. If anyone has any questions, Rich, again, uh, getting his work out. <laughs> doing the Stairmaster routine. Uh, if anyone has any questions, you, you've got some of the um, foremost experts on the topic here in the room, so please feel free. Anyone? Up here. At the top, of course. <laughs> Hello, my name is Darlene Wetley. Um, I have two sons that was affected by the, their twins. Um, my question is, I, I kept hearing a lot of things about the landlords and the different entities and the different grants, right? But what I haven't heard besides Ms. Bird, I don't know if she's still here, she was the only one who I heard speak about the children and the tenants. I keep hearing about all these different grants that are going to be granted for the city, that are going to be granted for the landlords. Where's the grants to protect the tenants and the babies? Where's the grants when a, a home is found to have had lead in it, where a tenant can go and say, you know what, there's lead in my home. I need to be placed over here. I can go stay over here, but I have to make sure that, you know, I can provide food and things like that at this house over here where I'm staying at so that the children and the parents are not staying in this household. Because at the end of the day, it causes a whole 360 throughout the whole house. It's not just the three-year-old children that are being affected because now it's the parent that now feels like they let their children down and they protect the children. So then at the end of the day, that mother now is looking like, okay, you know, I didn't do this. Maybe I didn't do this because now my childhood wasn't like this. It just brings up a whole lot of stuff. And it causes depression, it causes you to lose a job, it causes a whole lot of stuff to happen. And in my per personal situation, my landlord I know for a fact knew better because he owns over 250 properties. He's a realtor himself. I'm hearing something about this RPG, uh, what is it? RRP. So that, that, that's where somebody has to be certified, correct? Yes. <clears throat> my landlord, I, I only found this out just recently. Mind you, my children were affected November 19th. They did not. My house never passed inspection until March. Again, this is a person that owns 250 properties and is a realtor. It shouldn't have took that long. But whatever, it is what it is. But at the end of the day, I only just found out just recently within the last 72 hours that somebody needed to be there that was certified to make sure this worker came into the household and did this work properly. Little did I know that my landlord was the one that was certified and he was supposed to be there to make sure his worker did the work. He never showed up not one time. When they showed up to my home, they showed up with one can of paint and one little paintbrush. Never once did they ask me for a wet cloth. I'm now remodeling my house because I had to stay in that same house. Because yes, I did get Section 8. I tried to find somewhere else, and I have texts in my phone that can prove to you why I did not move while everybody will say, oh, just move. It's not that simple. You cannot just get up and move. So I, I, I'm now remodeling my, my own stuff. I'm buying gallons of paint myself every month because I don't even trust my landlord. No disrespect to the Department of Health, I don't even trust that either. Because the Department of Health came in, they said X, Y, Z, and they passed it. 
And at the end of the day, the paint is still chipping on my house. The places that they did not find the lead to be in was the places that I personally myself had remodeled. Once I found it was lead in this place, I stopped remodeling because I felt like if I put money into some place that the landlord is going to get the rent for it. So now he gets this grant, right? All these laws are being passed, all these rules are being passed, and guess what? He has open code violations, Section 8 is being passed, Section 8 is paying rent, the assessor is paying rent, everybody's getting paid, the landlord's getting blessed. But me and my family, little do, they, do anybody know, we're the ones that's hurting. I'm the one that just lost a job where we had a 401k plan. We all had health insurance. I'm the one that just lost a job where we was 90 days away from being able to tell DSS we no longer need your services. I was the one that was 90 days away from that. With being a single parent mother of nine children. That was me. Not, not, not my landlord. My landlord can go ahead and, and get on his boat anytime he wants. And go ahead and cast out his little fishing pole and go ahead and catch him some fish. Where me now, now I'm back at the very beginning. Now I'm back at the start. Now I'm back on DSS assistance. Now I'm back on Section 8 assistance. Now I'm sitting here trying to figure out how I'm going to pay Peter to pay Paul. You understand what I'm saying? This is what I'm going to do. This is the real entities. I see a whole bunch of entities on the table where you know you can represent for this town, this city, and everything. But I don't see any families that have been affected by lead up there on that stage right now that can actually tell people the real truth, the real deal, holy of what's really going on. Because it's a lot of stuff that's going on that's being swept beneath the rug and nobody's willing to talk about it. And I'm really fed up. Because children are being poisoned, it's like it's okay. And it's being swept underneath the rug. It's not okay. Because little do we know, just like how that young lady down here said, she, she's working with a young lady where she's seeing it years later. Years later, my twins are three years old. I'm watching my three-year-old son right now be so violent till it's not even funny. He can't sit still. He cannot sit still. No matter what I do, he cannot sit still. Yeah. Do you know how hard that is to be a single parent mom of nine children that have two twins and one of them cannot sit still no matter what I do to save their life? This is me that's dealing with that. Not of these entities, but my landlord, at the end of the day, he's getting the grant. So this is what I'm asking y'all. When y'all go ahead and y'all making these laws, when y'all passing these laws, when y'all passing these rents, make sure you start including our families that are really being affected by these laws. Make sure you include the families. Make sure you have a place for us to go that's safe. Where we're going and they're not going to lead and remediating it, make sure we have some place safe where we can go. Make sure we have some fallback where if we need a security deposit or something like that, we have a fallback plan and we're not just being sat here and we're just being basically pushed to the side. It's all about the landlord and the city and making sure that everything looks good on paper because that's not what it's about. Because at the end of the day, I'm the one that's going to suffer 10, 15 years from now. I, I appreciate that. Thank you, Darlene, for your, for your comments. Um, so two are questions. What can be triggered by tenants? What protections are there for tenants to, you know, we, we've, as to a point, talking about what grants landlords can get, can those be triggered by tenants and what can tenants do uh, to raise the flags and, and improve their situation? Um, any tenant has a right to request an inspection from the health department flood program and talk with us about your circumstances. And they have a right to ask for a code enforcement inspection. Uh, we encourage tenants to call us to talk about what's going on in their home to see if we need to come and do an inspection and what needs to happen in terms of the landlord. Um, we're not the right folks to talk about tenant rights, but I believe there are people here in the room that are, um, and I believe there are folks out at the tables that can provide specific guidance about tenant rights um, and how to navigate difficulties between yourself and your, and your landlord. Yeah, Darlene, I, I know I see Sharon Sherman in the back there. If you guys want to connect afterwards, it might be good to let her know what protections are available for her. Um, all right, any other questions? Anyone else? Comments? Okay. Joe, just one question. You probably can hear me. Uh, everyone that talked tonight spoke English. What do you do with uh, people that only speak or understand Spanish? Do you have, uh, thank you. Yeah, so um, up at the home headquarters table, we do have um, a piece of paper on some of the lead programs that are available. One side is English, the other side is Spanish. Um, in addition to the lead video that we are doing, as I mentioned, we do have some additional funding, and one of the next resources we're going to do with that funding is also put that in different languages, Spanish being one of them. Um, a number of the lead education pieces are translated into multiple languages, including Spanish. Our web page can be translated. There's a translator tool on the county web page. So any information that's present there can be translated into the chosen language. That's a great question. Um, the city of Syracuse uses a service called Language Line. And anytime someone, we can buy a video 
phone and with our code inspectors, anybody, if, we, if you contact the city of Syracuse, we can work with a third party um, on a wide variety of languages, um, with the telephone or um, by a web link. Yes, we all county programs and services. Thank you. Katie, I would say, is that the same for 211? Yes, we also utilize language lines, so um, we can connect with an interpreter for pretty much any language um, our caller speaks. How does that work, if you don't mind me asking? Sure. Um, if we recognize the language, we can get a prompt on the language line to choose the correct translator. If we don't, um, there is the ability to um, connect with an, with an interpreter who can listen to the caller and determine what dialect they're speaking and then connect us with the appropriate interpreter. So is that like a national service that just the third party enters into the phone call? Um, is it, it local? Well, it's a paid service that we have at 211. Um, I think it, it might be the same service that you guys use, um, the language line. Um, but you just have to dial 211, and then we'll make that connection to an interpreter. Great, interesting. Thank you. Anyone else? Questions? For the community grant, we heard we got close to $10 million here in the, between the city and the county. Those applications, when do we expect those first homes to start being remediated? When do we expect the work to start? I believe we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 applications over for um, scheduling inspections, and um, that's within the next, I, I would say within a month, work. We receive bids that will come back um, and work can commence. And there's another, I don't know, 60 to 80 applications, I think, in the hopper working their way through. You know, as I mentioned earlier, I think some of the hardest parts of these programs is collecting all that documentation and getting the, that applicant ready for that next phase in the construction. I don't know if you want to speak more Yeah, there's a lot of paperwork to do at the beginning of the process to get it up and running. And the city now is at a point where they're requesting the release of the funds so that we can get going. The county has done the inspections at 14 different homes during the first quarter of the grant. And we have a bunch of qualified applications to start with um, beyond those 14 to keep it going. The county just received their notice of their new grant last Friday. We're wrapping up the grant that we currently have it expires at the end of um, October, and because we're a renewal, uh, it should go a little faster than the, the city had to go through a new grant process. So the renewal process usually is a little quicker. So we're hoping to have it running right, right after the uh, first of the year. Okay, so from the time the inspector comes out to the time <coughs> it gets done, you have an estimate of when that happens. Um, what else? What do you think? So basically when the inspector comes back, they write a scope of work, you know, do window 457, do the door, do this, do that. Um, it, we, we send that out to bid, and then when the bids come back, and it, sometimes it just depends on when the contractor that, that gets the winning bid is, is available. Um, but I think we estimate, hopefully from that period when the inspection is done, when work commences, is somewhere around the six week mark. Once you're certified as qualified to receive funds. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming out. Thanks to the county for putting this all together. Thanks to our panel of experts for coming out. I uh, appreciate everyone's participation. Thanks to Rich for running up and down the stairs. And uh, thank you all for coming out. And uh, hopefully we can get to a Let's Save community uh, sometime in the near future. Thank you all for attending. Thanks again.